Welcome. Um, my name is Greg Markey. I am the um, the U.S. Uh, North American South American representative for CKGSB um, here in our New York offices. We, um, for those of you that are here the first time, we welcome you to our offices. We hope you like them. On a nice day, you can really see out. It's a beautiful view. We're getting down to nighttime, so it's going to be a little bit harder, but it is a wonderful opportunity and. Um, we're very excited to be uh, with the National Committee of U.S. and China Relations um, sponsoring this uh, knowledge series. We at CKGSB run these knowledge series on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, we do them here in New York, we do them out in Silicon Valley, and we do some in Washington, D.C. over the coming year. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll capture everyone's contact information and uh, as we do futures, we'll, we'll notify you and, let, and invite you to some of the events. This is our first ones. The first one we're doing with the, um, the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations, and we're very excited to be working with Steve and his group. Um, for those of you who don't know, Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, CKGSB, is the leading private business school in China. Um, we've been around for about 12 years, and we are, we are really known to be educating the top of the pyramid, the uh, senior executives of many of the China private businesses. Um, we have a few state-owned executives in our programs, but most of them are, um, are those who are founders and CEOs of, of the leading China private businesses. And we have many illustrious um, alumni, um, uh, the CEO of Alibaba, Jack Ma is an alumni of ours. Uh, most of the Americans know him, but most of the other ones, we um, CEO of, um, of Sinopac is an alumni of ours, CEO of Fosun is an alumni of ours, um, and many, many of the uh, of the leading private businesses in China have come to our school. We in the U.S. are building programs and initiatives to educate um, U.S. and Westerners on how to do business in and with China. So while we have a huge campus in, uh, Shang in Beijing, Shanghai and Shenzhen, we are doing executive programs here in the U.S. For, um, for multinational corporations, for their senior executives, and for individuals who want to learn more about China. So any of you that want to hear about some of the programs that we offer here in the U.S., please see me or one of my colleagues. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, my, um, our Associate Dean of Global Programs, Professor um, Bo Hong Sun, is here, and um, she is our uh, lead faculty here in the United States. So um, you can chat with her as well. Alan Chen, our Director of Business Development. Uh, Julie uh, Chu is one of our program managers, so feel free to chat with them. Um, and um, again, we'll, we welcome you. I don't want to take too much time out of Professor Hughes' um, opportunity for him to share with you, so I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Orlens, the President of uh, National Committee of the U.S. Thank you. Uh, thanks, and I thank you for providing the space. This is the first program we've done together with Chungkwan Graduate School of Business, and I think I should say it's very important that you're here and you're performing an important function in strengthening the relationship between the United States and China. So thank you for providing this venue and thank you for performing that function. Before introducing Professor Hu, let me turn it over to the head of the Consensus Media Group delegation who is known to many in the United States, many in China, to just say a few words of welcome. Zhou Zhixing, you can go Jiang Jiju. Hi, Ni Ni Zai Ma, can you speak? Hi, Ni Zai Ma. <laughs> we actually worked together before last year about the same time. Today, I saw the President of Olin Si is leading the group. I feel very sad. I actually, <laughs> I actually came in feeling sad when I saw my dear friend Steve Arlen on scratches. But I have a very I am very uh, I have a very firm faith that because he doesn't move much now because of his food injured food, I'm sure his brain is turning much faster. <laughs> Last year, about the same time, uh, we took a similar trip. 
with a bunch of very famous and very good Chinese scholars. And this year, we are doing exactly the same thing with a different group of also very established, famous, and good scholars. 为了节约时间，我不想，呃，每一个教授都介绍了，因为我看印的材料上都有每个人的介绍。Uh, in order to save time, I'm not going to introduce each and every one of them. I see that you have a brochure with you with a bio of each and one of them. 总之要告诉大家的是，呃，我们来的这几位学者，都是中国，在他们本领域里面顶尖的学者。What I need to say is, I want you to know each and every one of the scholars are like the best in their field. 虽然我们演讲人只有胡碧亮一个人，胡碧亮教授一个人，但是我们华生教授，还有我们许章润教授、毛振华教授，他们都会有很多的这个心得可以跟大家分享。Because of we are we are really restricted by time, so today only one professor, Professor Hu, can give a presentation. But I want to let you know that all the other professors are willing to answer your questions and share their insight with you. 当然还有更加著名的秦晖教授。And you know we also have Professor Qin Hui, who is a very famous historian in China. 啊，呃，最后我想说，我们这次这个代表团是由深圳创新发展研究院和共识网共同组织的。我们这个毛振华教授是我们的团长。Well, last but not the least, I want to say this trip had been co-organized. By this institute called Innovation and Development in Shenzhen, and also us, the consensus group. And actually, say the real re leader of our group is Professor Mao. 嗯，我相信海尼的能能力，第一次接触到这个名词，他就能翻译的很好。<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, he, he said I did the translation accurately, even though the first time I heard this word. 好，最后再一次谢谢大家，谢谢欧伦斯先生。Lots of thanks to everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And really, as as Mr. Joe is saying, every we have so many people who could speak here today, but we have asked uh, Dr. Hu to speak. And normally, I don't go over what's written in the bio, but I have to say that the bio that we circulated suggests you're a professor, and you're you're the dean of the school at at, at Beijing, at the Beijing Normal University. But it doesn't talk about your career as an entrepreneur, as a creator of companies, as a writer of twelve books in in English. And in Chinese, this—it's a bio that if I gave all of his accomplishments, he would have no time to talk. So rather than do that, let me turn it over. You're obviously talking about a subject that is of enormous importance, which is the urbanization that is going on in China and how that's going to both drive the economy and change the face of China. So if we can suggest that you talk for about 20-25 minutes, we've got a very accomplished audience, including members of your own delegation, and then we'll have a discussion. But thank you so much for being here and for so generously giving of your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Uh, uh, good evening, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. It's really my uh, great honor to be here today to be with, with you to discuss one of the very important issues, uh, which is one of the new strategies issued by China last year, and which uh, what the Chinese people call the new urbanization in China. Uh, before my presentation, I would like to uh, thank the organizers from both sides, from China, from US side, and uh, I think uh, you know, many organizations involved in this organization. I thank you very much. And also, especially, my thanks to your Mr. Onins, uh, and uh, thanks to your, you know, attention, my thanks to Mr. March, Mr. March, to Mr. Zhou, Zhou Zixin, and Mr. Mao Zhenghuang. Thank you so much for your kind of support. So otherwise, I don't uh, have uh, such a good opportunity to be with you to, uh, this evening. Okay, <coughs> so I, uh, uh, the topic I'm going to, uh, you know, to discuss with you is new urbanization. I think everybody here very familiar with the concept of, of urbanization, right? Everybody knows urbanization. 
This is not new. This is a very common phenomenon for most of the countries, especially for developing countries. But developing countries, some, some, you know, most of the many developing countries still on the way of urbanization. But for the developing countries, they had rich experience in this area. But what is a new urbanization? So I don't know. Maybe some of you know that. Some of the, you know, don't understand it. <coughs> Excuse me. Even for most of the Chinese, they don't have a very clear idea. You know, I have been uh, in the area for research for many years. I sometimes also puzzle, puzzle about the new. So what's new, you know, when you talk about the urbanization? Why Chinese government put the new before urbanization? So I think I would like to uh, share with you my ideas based on my knowledge, very limited knowledge, you know, first of all, you know, uh, discussion about what's new. This is the natural question you may ask you may interest you to understand. And then uh, the second uh, question I would like to share and, uh, with you, so what are short, short comments from these new organizations? In the first part of the discussion, I will show most of the positive impact from the uh, implication, uh, implementation of the, uh, of the new strategy. And then second, what short comments? And uh, finally, the third part of the discussion so it's uh, related to what's the potential improvement. So what kind of improvements needed also based on my limited you know, knowledge. Okay, so that's uh, what I'm going to discuss with you. And then um, let's turn to your first point. What's new? We'll talk about new, new, new organization and what's new. Uh, as you know that last year, uh, almost exactly one year ago, in March 16th, uh, an important document issued by the State Council of Chinese, uh, Chinese government, which is called National or State uh, New Urbanization Plan 2014-2020. So that's, uh, <coughs> that's the origin for, for us, you know, to this is the basic background of us to discuss mm -hmm. this kind of issue today. So one year ago, the policy already issued. And I, I read very carefully uh, the document, the document is quite thick. I don't know whether some of you guys have been reading on this book. It's kind of a very thick book. So I find the three news, whether the, uh, the, uh, the document is thick, but the major, you know, many three news. The first new, you know, the, the first new, uh, when you link, link with the organization is, you know, the rural urban, integration. This is very new. I think this is very, also very important. China is a typical dual system, dual economy, dual social development uh, system. So th that means the difference between urban area and uh, rural areas uh, is big. So the urban and rural societies, they divide for quite a long time. This policy, this strategy, try to, you know, try to reduce the gap, try to integrate rural development and the urban development. So this is, I think, this is the most important point when you think about, when you talk about the new urbanization. From what sense we think about the integration of rural and urban development? Three points I would like to share with you. The first is the integration of the hooker system. As you know that the hooker system in rural area, what, you know, if you don't understand hooker system, you know, it's a kind of a family household the registration system, you know, which is very different. Some people belong to the rural areas after they're born, so they get the hooker system is very different from the urban people. But, uh, but in fact, you know, hooker is, is a simple way, but, you know, more important, you need to understand what's behind of a hooker. If you were born in rural areas, you get a rural hookup. So that means you get nothing, you know, from the public service, the public public goods provision from the government. You don't benefit the public goods provision from the government, you know, either from the central government or from the local government. So that's the uh, the, uh, the essence of the hookup system, right? So this time the government tried to integrate two different types of hookup together. But of course, in the uh, first stage, first step, only part of people can enjoy this kind of integration. That means 
some of people they migrated, rural people they migrated into urban areas already for some time. So normally, no less than six months. And so this is what the government uh, you know, defined. But six months, this is the basic requirement. If, we, if you really, you know, if, for most people, if you want to get to the uh, urban hookah, you know, you have to stay much longer than six months. But also in another conditions, you have to get some, you know, job, you have to buy the house in the, uh, in the, in the urban, uh, in, in the cities. So all these kind of things. So the, the government plan tried to, you know, try to provide 100 million uh, rural migrants to have a uh, city, you know, a uh, residence uh, hookup in the next, let me, let me see, five to six years. So this is the first point. The government tried to gradually integrate the dual, you know, the hookah system into unified hookah system. So no longer find the rural uh, hookah and the urban hookah, but normally we call it agriculture hookah and the non-agriculture hookah. So they are gradually integrating these two different kind of hookah system into one. This is very important, right? The second integration in relating to rural urban integration is the land market integration. So the land in China, if you talk, talk about the land system, there's two institutions, two ownerships in China. Part of the land owned by the state, directly owned by the state, or the urban land owned by the state directly. And then the old land in rural areas owned directly by, not directly by the <coughs> state, but by the connective organizations, like a village you know, organization. Village is re you know, representing the state, right? to hold the land, to have the land uh, in rights. And then uh, also on behalf of the state and the village, village connective organizations, they lease the land to the farmers. And then the farmers, you know, give a rental to the state through the, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, connective organizations, what we call the village, you know. So the integration of land market, the government tried to integrate it. You know, these are two different land ownership systems. Gradually, of course, this is just an initial step, right? So in the first step, the government tried to separate the rural land into two parts. One part of the rural land is farming land, which already listen to the, you know, to the farming. Farming land, you cannot change the function. You can always use it for farming, right? You know, another part of the land is not for, is the purpose not for farming, but for, for non-agriculture usage, right? You can uh, build up some uh, infrastructures, or can uh, have some, you can do some business relating to land uh, development in rural areas. But this part of the land will be, you know, the government will try to, to give the same price, the same rights to this part of the land. So that means, you know, the same place, the same land, they belongs to different the organizations, belongs to different units, but we have the same price. That's the market price. But before, it's different. The farming, the, uh, the rural land is never, you know, without uh, the uh, government permission, never can be transferred from agriculture usage or rural usage to urban usage or to your non-agriculture usage, right? They try to gradually you know, integrating these two land systems by, you know, introduce the uh, same price system into the, uh, uh, into the uh, different, you know, two, uh, uh, two, two type of lands, right? This is the second integration, land, uh, land integration. Third integration is the public goods provision integration. So that means that the government try to expand the public goods and public service provision, not only for rural people, but not only for urban or uh, urban people, but also to rural people, right? As you know that, you know, uh, after the foundation of Liu China, over the past more than six years, the farmers never benefit, as I mentioned that, you know, the uh, public goods uh, provision from the government, for example, the like, uh, education. 
even private, your basic education, pri private education, secondary education, even uh, you know, basic education, the farmers, the rural people, they have to pay for education. But, the urban, but people living in the urban areas, they, you know, their kids get an education without, you know, that's free. They don't need to pay for the education. And the healthcare. So this is for a long time, you know, it's the situation. But now they try to, the government try to integrate it to expand this kind of basic education from urban areas to rural areas. So that means rural peoples, they can also, you know, enjoy free education. Uh, they enjoy a little bit, uh, you know, like uh, uh, pension and uh, health care, this kind of uh, social security, right? So this is the second integration. As I mentioned that, you know, so this is the initial step. So you know, China will need to go uh, step by step, and this is uh, only the first step. So these are three major integrations in relating to the integration, uh, rural urban integration. This is the first new. When you think about the new evidence, it's most important if you think about the rural urban integration from the uh, you know, three dimensions I discussed with you. So this is the first, uh, first, <coughs> first point I would like to share with you. The second point in relating to new urbanization is to relating to how to organize the, the urbanization. So this is more spatial related issue. So a city should be concentrated somewhere or you know, in this area or that area. What's the main forms of, you know, of urbanization? Big cities, medium-sized cities, or small cities. So the second point is relating. What's the, what's, the, what's the suggestion from the government? What's the policy you know, suggesting from the government? Uh, actually, the decision already made. The government tried to, this is also new, the government tried to take the metropolitan region or city, cl uh, city cl uh, clusters. So that means put cities together, which form a kind of you know, metropolitan region or some cities put together, we can call also city clusters. So this is the suggestion, policy suggestion from the government to be the main form of urbanization in the future, in the future from, you know, in the next six years at least. I don't know for how long, but because this policy suggested for the, uh, for the five to six years. So this is second new. The form of the urbanization will be, will be mainly focused on how to develop in metropolitan regions, how to develop in city clusters in China. So that means China will, will be, this is kind of more centralized model. You know, like uh, we have three very big you know, metropolitan regions in China. Now, I think uh, all of you know very, very well about that. Delta region, you know, metropolitan Delta, uh, no, let me see, Pure River Delta, Pure River Delta metropolitan region, which now, you know, you, you gradually expanding from formerly Guangzhou, Shenzhen, right? Now expanded to include Hong Kong and Macau. So this is an area in Guangdong province, nearby Guangdong province, right? So this is what we call Pure River Delta metropolitan region. And then the second big metropolitan region is Yangtze River Delta uh, metropolitan region, which includes uh, many three, two provinces in one city, Shanghai city, in Jiangsu province and Zhejiang province, right? Hangzhou, Nanjing, and Shanghai. So, and then about, um, you know, 15 to 16 uh, cities included in these two metropolitan regions. The third big uh, metropolitan region is everybody put in, in the yellow, I think, and those it, it include Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei. Jinjinji, or uh, integration. This is a new uh, spatial policy and now the government has been a discussion. You know. So this is also a very hot topic. So these are three major you know, metropolitan regions. The central government takes responsibility for further development of these three you know, big metropolitan regions. And the central government was a core for the local governments to take responsibilities to develop local city clusters. For example, like uh, Henan province, you know, 
Honan province, they are about so you know, five to six cities. You can put six, six cities together by developing better transportation linkages among these cities. And also Hubei province, like the Wuhan. And also they try to, you know, to, 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 uh, to, to get uh, a more intensive linkage between Wuhan and the surrounding you know, eight cities. Right, become a uh, you know sub-regional metropolitan region. Mm -hmm. Local governments, you know, uh, I think many in the uh, provincial governments they have to take a responsibility for the developments of these you know second level uh, metropolitan regions. Right. So this is second uh, point, which I think is quite new uh, compared with before, because the government focus more on metropolitan region development not based on the single city development than before, right? This is the second uh, new. The third new point I would like to share with you, which is the, the uh, policy, this policy now, you know, focusing very much on the capacity building of sustainable development of cities. Uh, the central government, you know, gave some indicators to show what is the, the government court uh, sustainable development of cities. For example, you have to provide enough job opportunities for the people. If you build a city without the job opportunities, right? So most of the people get lost, they, they don't have a job in the city. So it's not, a, it's, it's not sustainable, right? And also the local government or the city government, you have to provide uh, better, uh, public goods or public services, right? And also green city, smart cities, these are, and also you have to, you have to improve, you have to find a better way to get the city development, urbanization better developed, right? Based, for example, one of the examples is the PPP model, you know, public-private partnership model. So uh, as you know that before, uh, urbanization Finance is, you know, is only, uh, if not only, maybe most of the finance uh, directly come from the government, from the city government. But now, the central government uh, proposed the local government, you have to work in together with the private people, private people, the investors from private sector uh, for building the infrastructure facilities to provide uh, the public services, you know, the hospitals and that, you know, uh, schools, in the city, right? So these, but, but there are so many areas to, for example, like water, you know, the water supply, transportation system improvement, these are all considered as uh, some of the very in important indicators for sustainable development of cities. These are three areas, I, based on my understanding, uh, you know, why the central government of China core urbanization is wrong of urbanization is a kind of new urbanization compared with the traditional or regular or old urbanization you know we had before. So this is the first uh, you know first part of the presentation I would like to uh, share with you. The second part I would like to very briefly the second part of the discussion. What would be, you know, what would be the uh, shortcomings, right? Because, because I just uh, discussed most of the, uh, you know, news, three news, are uh, more linked with the positive impact to the social and economic development. But what's the shortcomings from this kind of new urbanization strategy? Number one, regional disparity, disparity income disparity, regional disparity, generally, maybe not only, you know, economic development, social development, anyway, the disparities among the regions will be getting bigger and bigger. Because the central government will be focusing on the metropolitan region, like, uh, you know, as I mentioned that, Yangtze River Delta, urbanization, uh, metropolitan region, and um, uh, Pure River Delta, uh, metropolitan region, and the Beijing, Tianjin, Hobei province, uh, Hobei metropolitan region. These areas, they are better, much better development regions in China. Only if you look at the total area of these you know, three metropolitan regions, put them together, only 2.8% of the total land uh, area of the country in terms of territory 
only 18 percent of the total population of the country. But how much GDP generated? That means wealth generated from these three metropolitan regions, 36 percent. So that means they are much better, you know, uh, developed than other regions, even without this kind of a new urbanization strategy. After implementing this kind of a new uh, urbanization strategy, I think they were getting, you know, faster, you know, development or growth than before. And then the rest of the regions will be gradually left behind, you know, left behind bigger. You know, can then just so the gap between these three metropolitan regions and other regions will be getting, you know, not and uh, larger. So this is the first, you know, concern uh, in my mind. We have to think about that. So this is one of the shortages. And the second shortages, the second shortage, I think, is the uh, if you read the uh, the uh, the document the report, I think the government you can let the environment protection. Especially decarbonization. Decarbonization has not even mentioned in the report. You know, uh, decarbonization is very important. It's the key for environment pro pro uh, protection. I think in the city, in the cities. So this is uh, uh, we need to uh, to uh, to uh, to emphasize this in the future. And the third area, uh, I think the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the problem, uh, the shortcomings is I think the government ignore the importance of the market. It's still, based on my understanding, is still a government, uh, government net uh, program. So the major driving force of new urbanization, I think it is still the government, it's not the market, right? Uh, uh, for example, the government mentioned that the three 100 million people so the government said, I'm going to, you know, provide 100 million people with the urban hookah in the big cities. And then I plan to encourage 100 million people to stay in the medium-sized or small cities. You don't go to big cities, right? And um, another uh, 100 million is, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are three uh, 100 millions. This is the government plan, but it's not market regulation. So the government tried to still follow the traditional way of uh, developing the cities, developing a uh, push forward the organization regardless, you know, old organization or new organization. So the mentality, I don't think it has been changed. It's still an uh, old mentality to push forward urbanization development based on the government, not on the market. These are three major shortcomings from the uh, new government you know, policy or strategy based on my, my general evaluation. So finally, the second part, I would like to hear how to get improvement. What kind of improvements is needed? Uh, but this is just simply follow the, uh, the, uh, the shortcomings, I just, uh, as I just mentioned that. Number one, you need to, you know, uh, you, you need to net the government, uh, no, the, uh, net the market to play more important role for in the process of new, new, new urbanization. As, you know, as we know that, in the uh, process of uh, old urbanization, government played to, you know, deceitful role the, I think the only rule. So everything is design, you know, decided by the government in, uh, before in the process of urbanization. But now, you know, during the uh, new urbanization, I think we need to you know, focus more on the market force. So this is a major driving force for uh, urban, uh, urbanization, especially, especially for new urbanization. But of course, you know, urbanization, you need to get to combine the efforts. It's a kind of combined efforts between the government and the market. So I think we need to get a balance, right? The government need to play, take some responsibilities, and the market will, at the same time, also play a very important role. So get a balance between the government and the market. The second balance, I think, uh, is we need to balance the expansion 
and the concentration. Over the past more than 30 years, so uh, if we say the, during the process of older urbanization, the major you know, form of urbanization is the expansion. For example, <laughs> if uh, anybody, I don't know, I think, I guess most of the people you have, uh, many people you have been in Beijing. So Beijing, when I came to Beijing in the early 1980s, so we have running, you know, the uh, third rail road had been under construction at that time. But if now, you know, go to Beijing now, we have seven roads already built uh, many time, uh, many years ago, and then we have four rail roads, uh, fourth rail road, the fifth rail road, the sixth rail road. Six rail roads are already finished. You know, six rail roads is quite far from the center. So what may, you know, if the uh, seventh rail road is, uh, you know, discussion for the construction. So that will be most part of the seventh rail road that will be in Hebei province, not in Beijing, uh, Beijing city. I think this is one of the reasons, you know, the President Xi Jinping proposed to, you know, to, to integrate Beijing into Hebei, into Tianjin, you know, so, <laughs> so become a bigger area. So it's easy for Beijing to build in, uh, you know, eight ring road, and nine ring road, right? <laughs> so this is purely, you know, expansion. This is a traditional way of, you know, pushing forward urbanization, which have been happened, not only in China, but also in many, many, you know, developed countries, right? Especially in Europe. So now we need to change this kind of pattern of urbanization, right? We need to get balance. Expansion is necessary in certain extent, but it's not the only way to improve, you know, to improve urbanization, uh, to, your, to your push forward urbanization, especially on this time, we need to more concentrated, more concentrated. More, one of the, uh, you know, the reasons for the cities to, be, to get more concentrated is good to reduce you know, uh, carbon dioxide you know, uh, emission. So this is uh, 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 carbon dioxide emission is, uh, is, a, is a big concern. You know, once you get uh, more relatively concentrated in a certain place, so mm, you don't need to use your private car, you need to drive you know, so far, uh, you know, uh, uh, very far from your working place to your home, right? Okay. So when you get balance between the concentration and the expansion, this third, you know, balance. We need to balance economic growth and the social development. Uh, as I just mentioned, so you, you know, uh, environment protection, right? And this is part of a very important social development. But for most of the cities, most of the mayors. They're always concerned, always thinking. Most of the you know, city mayors, they think about, concern very much about the economic growth, GDP growth. But they, you know, they don't pay uh, much attention for the social development, like uh, environmental protection. So this is why if you come to Beijing, it's a warfare, you know. So the air, the air has been uh, you know, seriously polluted. So, they, so we need to get a balance of economic and social development. So these are three, you know, points I would like to share with you. Uh, you know, these are the, uh, you know, some uh, improvements uh, I think uh, is needed for the uh, further new urbanization. So these are three major three uh, parts of, uh, of my presentation based on my understanding, based on my very limited knowledge for your comments, for your criticize, for your, you know, questions. Okay, thank you very much. Again, uh, thank you for the organizers. Thank you very much for taking the precious time to be with me uh, for uh, 30 minutes. Thank you very thank much. You, Professor Lee, thank you. Let's talk about the HUCO reform and how HUCO reform is being used as a strategy for urbanization. You suggested, I think, that the three major um, metropolitan areas Beijing, you know, the Shanghai area and the Pearl River Delta area would be drawing in even more people. But the Hukou reform, as I understand it, is not applying to the tier one cities, that it's actually only going to apply to the to, to lower level cities that rural residents can get Hukou. So how does that, how are they using Hukou reform to kind of deal with urbanization and then the second part of that question is what would be the effect if they just did away with the hookah 
Okay. Uh, I first give some, uh, you know, my comments. If uh, I'm uh, not correct, or maybe yeah. If I'm wrong, maybe you know, my colleague, uh, or Professor Fasin, can uh, correct it. You know, he knows much than I know in this area. He uh, wrote some books. Uh, you know, he did a lot of research in this area. Okay. Uh, I think this is uh, is a, is a, is a very very good question because you know they contradict with each other because one of the uh, strategies is focusing on metropolitan region development under the uh, new urbanization you know framework right so that means will be you know this policy will make uh, these three big metro metropolitan regions much more attractive to the peoples, especially for the rural peoples than before. So that means, you know, more people rushing into the, uh, you know, the uh, metropolitan region, big cities, first tier cities. And then, according to the Hukou reform, you know, uh, policy, the sequences is, the government tried to renax the control of Hukou, not from big cities, right. but from the uh, small cities, right? And then your policy make more attractive the people from moving from small cities to the big cities. So it's difficult for the implementation of the house, you know, hukou system because the hukou in the small cities and medium sized you know, medium sized cities less attractive. People don't care about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 re relaxation of hukou in the uh, small cities. They don't care. They just want to rush in the big cities. But the government is still, even under the Hugo reform system, the, gov the first priority of the government is to more strictly control the Hugo in the big cities like Beijing, uh, Shanghai. So they only release you know, very limited number. I think it's just a half of the uh, number than before, right? So they are contradicted with, uh, contra uh, contradicted with, 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 with con they are contradicted with each other. My idea is very simple. You know, you just, uh, you know, open the hookup for everyone. But who make a decision? You know, the people who are coming into the cities, into this city or in that city, based on market regulations, based on the, uh, some signals, like uh, price signals. If you live in New York, everybody, I think, in the world, most of the people, not everybody, most of the people, many people, maybe, you know, more, I think it's better than like New York, right? Then I come to you in New York, but the cost of living in New York is much, much higher than living in the village, in a small town. So these, so in US, in uh, UK, they don't have a hookah system. But people, they, they know very well where they should allocate it because the market mechanism working very well. So my answer is very simple. So the whole system need to fully you know, removed, but building up the market mechanism for whole system rework under the new mechanism. So that's uh, okay. this is why I propose you know you need to focus more on market system, not the government uh, you know intervention or government plan. This is right? Does it read it clearly when when someone moves from a, a rural? area to an urban area, it increases their productivity significantly yeah. and increases GDP. Yeah. But it doesn't really increase regional disparity though, because the average, even though they have become more productive, mm -hmm. they actually in the initial years lower the per capita GDP of the urban area, because yeah. they're actually earning below the average if they move to Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Chongqing, Chengdu, I mean, it's, it's lowering that average. So in fact, the, the, even though the GDP as an absolute is increasing, rural migration lowers per capita GDP, and therefore almost the Gini coefficient between the, re the regional disparity doesn't really increase, does it? That's uh, that depends. You are you know partially right, or partially you know not right. You know, if, if you need to think about China size, <coughs> if developed the regions, developed the cities, only occupied a very you know small part of the country, right? And we need to remember. Now, uh, 
we still have about uh, 600 million people, uh, more than, I think, uh, more than about 700 million people still living in rural areas. Even up to 2020, so China's urbanization reached a level of 60%, say, I just assume, more or less, about 60% at that time. So that means we still, you know, have you know, more than 500 people living there. So if you focus, so if you look at the logic of resource flow, like capital, talented people, and uh, you know, there will be flow from the underdeveloped regions to the cities, especially to the first tier cities, to the metropolitan regions, right? Because the size is big. Anyway, we will have some people living in the underdeveloped regions, at least 500 million. Right, so that means after the region, uh, uh, metropolitan region gets much better developed, and then the gap between these much better developed regions will be much higher than the underdeveloped regions. Right, uh, one of the uh, strategies which is matched to this new urbanization uh, strategy, I also remind you to you are, you know, think about, which is a new socialist uh, building. Uh, new socialist countryside program, which implement, uh, implemented from 2006, but I don't think that 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 that, 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 not, that, that that's not very eff effective, right? So, so that that means you know even the you know the region get get get, get developed, the uh, production productivity get increased, but still some people were living in rural area in the uh, you know uh, no productivity area because of the big size. This is uh, my understanding to your question. I don't know if you know, it's uh, right or not. Yeah. What about allowing for transfer, sale of land, so that the, the rural resident can just take that savings and move? OK, so that's uh, relating to another very important, more critical reform, land reform, right? As I mentioned, that the water land you know, owned by the, by the government, by the state through different two ways. One is the state. The state directly owns the urban land. And another organization is a connective organization owns the land on behalf of the state, right? So uh, this is good if a private, you know, private land system, so the farmers, they can sell the land. So they get the money. They can use the money for investment, doing their business. That will be very good. So, the, so they have assets. And then they have a return from the investment of assets or assets management. They, but in China, is I think in the uh, you know uh, in the uh, in the foreseeable future, it's difficult to see this kind of uh, land uh, you know land reform happen. So this is a problem. We need to push forward on land reform. Wouldn't it be an enormous driver of economic growth if it were allowed? Uh, the sales were allowed. Wouldn't it be a real driver of economic growth? Oh, yeah, that would, be, that would be very, very big. It would be you know, huge. Driving force, huge, huge, huge. You know, because all the assets controlled by the government, so that means right. <coughs> almost no, there's no mobility. You know, the growth, you know, and the efficiency produced more from the uh, flow of uh, adjustment. Uh, you know, I just mentioned the, the, the factor. This, uh, factors. Land is the most important factor for for production, right? Huge potential. Mm -hmm. After this kind of mobi mobility of land, you know, will happen. That will be you know, another very, very strong uh, motivation, driving force for sustainable economic growth in China in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Last question, then I want to open it up for questions, which is the new normal is six and a half, seven percent GDP growth. What percentage, it, w when they do the plan, what percentage? of that growth is based upon the new urbanization? Uh, yeah, they need to, uh, uh, new normal is a kind of uh, new phenomenon and a new topic. Uh, you know, uh, most of discussion, debates just happened this year. A new urbanization proposal and a policy have been issued by the government, right? Uh, very limited research have been mentioned, you know, link with them. Uh, based on my guess, I think uh, you know uh, new urbanization is, uh, from one hand, is very uh, important driving force 
for sustainable economic growth in the future. But on the other hand, because we require more environment protection, so urbanization rate will be slowing down. So after balance, I think uh, you know more or less about seven percent, you know, of the GDP growth will be was a match to the new normal of urbanization. But what percentage of the growth is based upon urbanization? Yeah. Uh, it be, it, can it be quantified? Uh, can be, but uh, yeah, uh, I just mentioned the uh, you know the uh, the national GDP growth. So if you uh, ask the yeah, I know the contribution from the contribution, the contribution, yeah, contribution from new urbanization or from urbanization? From urban from urbanization. Uh, my guess, you know, you can break down of the urbanization into some very important part. One is estate, right? This is most important. Estate contributed about 12% uh, of the GDP. And also, because of the uh, housing, like uh, real estate production also uh, still maintains uh, some related sectors, like uh, cement, like uh, steel. So I think about 22, 23 of the contribution from estate area, estate, uh, estate industry and the re related sector. If you, you know, by infrastructure, every infrastructure is very important. You put together, I think, 40%. This is only my, my guess, by guess. So urbanization has been playing a very, very important role for supporting economic growth in China uh, in the past, but it was, was a way to continue to support uh, the future uh, in China economic growth. If for 40%, that would be very high. Maybe and even less, maybe. 35%. I did not, frankly speaking, I did not uh, do this kind of uh, you know, calculation, but just based on my guess, you know, for your reference. Yeah. Let's open it for some questions here. Yes, Henry An with HHN Capital. Mm -hmm. Professor Hu, you talk extensively about the benefits, challenges, even improvements. Yeah. So we cover a lot of bases there. So let's take a shift gear a little bit. Um, can you maybe share your thoughts? You talked about the, the thick official document of this new urbanization in China. Areas that did not cover in that document, in your opinion, what do you think are the major challenges that did not talk about in that official document? That so you think of major concerns of yours with yeah. this new urbanization in China? Yeah, yeah. so I uh, concerned first uh, the environment protection, especially decarbonization, is not, not, is not touched. Decarbonization did not mention any. There's no one word talk about decarbonization in the cities. But you know, most of the carbon you know, uh, uh, produced by more than 70% of the carbon produced from cities. So you have to very much focus on, on decarbonization in the process of decarbonization. If you see, uh, based on my understanding, I think this is the most important uh, you know, phenomenon and the feature compared with the new urbanization with the uh, older, older urbanization or traditional urbanization. But this, this kind of, uh, you know, this point that you not mentioned in the, in, in the document. This is very uh, unfortunate. And secondly, I think uh, how to get a balance of uh, Rural, uh, rural development and uh, urban new uh, uh, urbanization under the new urbanization way. Some of the you know some of the factors I just mentioned the three areas. But how to improve the productivity from agriculture sector? How to make the small towns and the rural areas more attractive to the people? You know, if we're only based on the you know on the development of big metropolitan regions. And then um, the regional disparity, as we discussed, will be continued increase. So this link with the uh, you know, uh, regional disparity. So this is also neglected in the in the document. And then uh, land market, land reform, as uh, you know, Mr. Owens mentioned very correctly. This is, is very important. You need to put land land system, land reform. Appropriate rights, these kind of things, by link with new urbanization. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't work. Right? These are three, you know, areas. I think the government need to also the market. Generally speaking, as I mentioned, the market, you know, play a more importance uh, in the process of new urbanization than in the uh, urbanization. These are four, and these are four areas. 
I suggest the government uh, need to be uh, re uh, take their consideration again. Isn't higher concentration more ecologically friendly? That you have a lower carbon footprint when you're in a building like this than if you're in a suburb? Uh, yes, theoretically speaking, some recent research have been uh, you know, published uh, by in the U.S. in Germany, and once you know the city got more concentrated, the the, uh, the no carbon problem. you know will be reduced, will be will, 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 will be less than you you know the the, the expansion. <coughs> Many because of the private uh, car usage. Right, and then you have a concentrated mass people using car for their transportation. They don't need to move, you know. They were born here, the education here, the hospital here, education here, hospital here. So they don't need to move at all, right? So this is the same reason right behind. Was it Chairman Mao who said China must build up, not out? Uh, build up, not out. I think it was. Oh, that's we have a good <laughs> point, right? So Mao already mentioned before. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> John Allen, Greater China Corporation. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hu. This was excellent. Now, my question is, as part of this urbanization process, does China try to incentivize or provide disincentives for going to one part of the country or another, or one city as opposed to another? Is this part of the plan? Uh, this is part of the plan, but, uh, you know, based on the government plan, as I just mentioned, this is the government, what the government, based on the government, what the government thought. Maybe the reality is, is, is quite different. It's very different. So, because they think, I plan this way, or maybe the farmers, and the, uh, you know, the residents, they don't follow this kind of uh, policy suggestions, but they follow the uh, market regulations. So Are there incentives, though, or disincentives for going to one part of the country or another, or one city? Is there financial incentives, or FUCO incentives, or disincentives? Of course, and this is kind of very strong, you know, uh, incentives gave to the people to move in more, right, than before. Based on the new urbanization program. Gave a strong incentive for the people moving from to move the to the northwest as opposed to Shanghai or Beijing? Uh, yeah, from the under, should we say, from the under developed regions to uh, the developed the developed regions include uh, northeast of China, southeast of China, uh, <coughs> southwest of China, right? These uh, these regions are under developed regions in China, but in the uh, coastal region area in the south, you know, they are much better, you know, developed. Yeah, that's the general situation. We need to close, but let me ask a question which I'm sure no one has ever asked you which is, what are the implications for this urbanization for the U.S.-China relationship? Oh, oh, very big, but very, let me think about that. E yes, of course. You know, number one, we learn too much, you know, in terms of urbanization model. We learn too much from the U.S. rather than Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, if you go to Eastern Europe, there's no big cities. If you, you know, we just came to the Imperial building. You know, um, uh, 86 uh, 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 stories there. So if you look at outside all the uh, sky highs and uh, the big buildings, right? So China, China followed this kind of uh, model. I think uh, we need to rethink it, uh, you know, whether this kind of uh, model is the best model for, for urbanization. We need to learn a little bit more, my personal idea, learn a little bit more from Western Europe. If you go to Europe, there's not much big cities. You know, it's just Berlin, Paris, London. Three cities based on the uh, standard of, uh, you know, uh, Chinese people now. But if you look at New York, you know, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, right? So big cities. So we need to work together to discuss about the future of cities, whether this kind of model sustainable or not, right? So exchange idea about that urbanization model. You know, we learned from U.S. before, but we also hope to learn, you know, in the future uh, from in, from U.S. as well. And then some related to like the design, right, related to business, a lot of businesses, like the design, architecture, and uh, materials. When you use, use new materials, right, 
green materials and uh, this kind of new materials, right? So a lot of uh, investment opportunities and uh, and the industry uh, opportunities for for us to to cooperate in the future. But I don't know. <laughs> a business opportunity which strengthens the relationship. Let me call on our friends from Chung Kong to, to uh, close the proceedings for this evening. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Hu. Thank you, Steve, for providing your insight and sharing uh, your time with us. Uh, my name is Alan Chen. I'm the Director of Business Development here at Chung Kong Graduate School of Business in Americas. Um, much like the National, uh, National Committee on U.S. and China Relations, we build uh, U.S. and China relations through the art of learning, through education. Um, so here in the United States, we build many great partnerships with the top business schools here. We're not here to compete, we're here to complement our partners on thought leadership in China. Um, as you can see in the folders, um, to do, uh, one of the programs we do is with Columbia Business School, um, a three-day executive education program on how to do this with China. We also just signed in February with Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, we're going to be focusing more on U.S. China policies. Um, at the same time, we're talking to Stanford Engineering School. We're going to be focusing on innovation coming out of China. Um, I'm going to turn your attention really quickly to the ILE program. This is our, we have a very exciting program coming this summer uh, in, con in conjunction with the Cornell Johnson School of Business. Um, they recently received an endowment of over 10 million to fund a Smith family initiative. And we joined hands with them to uh, offer um, a three-week program for legacy family members from both US and China. This is sort of the first uh, program that we created this way. Um, and I hope you can learn more about it. If you have more questions, please contact me, Greg and Julie. Um, and we'll be here. Uh, again, I want to thank, uh, again, Steve, your team, um, Kate, Margo, uh, John, uh, for working with us, and we hope that we can bring many more of these series uh, in the future. Thank you again. Have a great night. I want to thank you guys for your participation. Very good questions and comments. And thank you, Mr. Audience. Very good questions, but too much. You know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Very good questions. I mean, a lot of fun questions. Thank you.